Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap today, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, just know you'll be able to listen to it on demand. Following today's broadcast, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question for either of our panelists at any time during today's presentation, don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll take a few minutes near the end of today's broadcast and go through those questions. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Container Incidents by Tabletop, Intro to Real-Time Security Operations. Our speakers today are Dave Cliff, who is Head of Strategic Use Cases at PagerDuty, and Tim Buntel, VP of AppSec Product at ThreatStack. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Charlene. Very, very glad Thanks, to be so here. Great, great. So, Tim, I think you're kicking us off today, so I'm going to put myself on mute and hand it over great. to you and let you do it. Yeah, terrific, terrific. Um, yeah, I appreciate it, Charlene. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time uh, to join us today. It's a great conversation uh, that we have on tap, and I, and I like this combination of, um, you know, threat stack perspective on, you know, kind of finding and responding to incidents and uh, PagerDuty's incredibly deep experience with kind of helping organizations be successful managing them. So I think it's a great combination and, and uh, thrilled to be joining you, Dave, uh, to talk about it today. So, so let's kind of um, set the stage here. You know, what we're really fundamentally talking about today is, you know, how do you respond to a security incident, right? But in order to you know, be able to respond well to an incident, it means having a plan <laughs> for how to respond. And having a plan is only good if you are able to practice how to follow that plan, right? You know, if we put a plan in place and we sit it up on the shelf and we, we have no idea how to actually execute it when it comes time, uh, things are, are going to trip us up invariably. Um, but then ultimately, you know, sort of having a plan is only helpful if you can detect the incident in the first place. And that leads to identification and uh, of when an incident actually happens. So we really see all of these parts uh, connecting together. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. So what we'll do is we'll start um, by describing a real world attack, um, something that happened to be on an app running in a Docker container. And from there, we're going to explore sort of what are some good ways of detecting and stopping and managing that attack? Um, and then what we can do is, is drill into some of the proven techniques that I mentioned uh, from PagerDuty uh, and others uh, to develop and, and sort of practice your own plan to be able to respond uh, just as well if you ever find yourself uh, in, a, in a similar sort of incident. Uh, and we all know that certainly the data uh, suggests that no matter what kind of company you're in, sooner or later you, you will find yourself uh, having to respond to one of these sorts of incidents. So uh, I'll kick it off. I'll start by talking about uh, a real-life attack, uh, and then we'll start to, to take these other parts, the planning and practicing, into, into account. So um, here at ThreatStack, uh, we offer a full-stack security observability solution uh, that's used by lots of different organizations. Um, we also offer a managed service, which we call the Cloud SecOps Program. And that provides a, a fully staffed SOC for our customers, uh, where we collect signals from lots of different parts of your application environment, from the host up through containers and orchestration platforms, uh, the infrastructure control plane. Uh, we take that in and are able to uh, monitor that and look for different uh, potential problems and ultimately help the customers make decisions on how to respond to those. And of course, we'll be getting into that response phase uh, a little shortly after. And you know, the reason I start by talking about this Cloud SecOps program is to point out that the story that we're going to walk through here is actually true. Um, this was something that was identified and stopped by this uh, team that we have in our um, security operations center just a couple of months ago. Uh, now, of course, not all attacks look exactly the same, uh, but how you detect uh, and really how you're going to respond to them uh, should follow uh, these good practices and, and patterns. 
So uh, what we're going to walk through here today, like I said, is a real-world uh, exploit that happened. Uh, in this case, it's pretty interesting because it's leveraging Docker, which we know uh, has been you know, really changing the way that a lot of organizations deliver software, but we haven't seen as many kind of real-world uh, security incidents from it. So uh, this one actually is real. In this case, it's a crypto jacking scenario. It's essentially a, a sort of denial of resources attack, right, if you will, uh, sort of um, denial of wallet <laughs> is another way to think of it, right? Using uh, you know, somebody else using your own paid resources for their you know, nefarious purposes. Um, uh, obviously, on-prem and virtual server workloads have uh, you know, kind of high visibility and control, but the complexity is there, whereas as we move to containers and orchestrated uh, workloads uh, like Kubernetes or even further uh, with managed containers like EKS or ECS or uh, Fargate, you know, you're lowering that complexity, but you're also getting lower visibility. So having this opportunity to look at the signals that are coming from all of, throughout the entire application stack becomes really important. And as an attacker, you know, I can go for these complex attacks on high value targets, or I can go for these sort of wide, low effort attacks on low value targets, and, and crypto mining is really a good example uh, of the latter. So these attacks are be becoming more sophisticated, leveraging the new infrastructure, and, and that's what we'll walk through today, okay? So how exactly does the attack work? Well, we start out by uh, finding a website that's vulnerable to remote code injection, right? I wanna be able to start taking advantage of uh, somebody else's resources, so I need to be able to get my own uh, control in there. Um, you know, this has been an OWASP top 10 vulnerability since they started, and that was, what, 15 years ago or something, and yet this problem still persists. Um, it, basically, it occurs when an application passes unsafe user-supplied data, right? This could be forms or cookies or HTTP headers or whatever, uh, and then that'll go to a system shell, and that's usually uh, caused by poor input validation, right? So, uh, for example, uh, a function that uses a Unix command to inter interact with the file system, you know, maybe the attacker can uh, tack on a semicolon and then another Unix command. And so, unbeknownst to the system, it's actually processing multiple things uh, in that remote code scenario. Uh, we see this a lot in uh, the applications that we look at, um, and every language has these problems. You know, Node.js, the child process exec, uses a shell to, to execute commands, right? So if there's external input that executes that command dynamically, well, you know, you're gonna have a problem. So in this case, I'm not gonna tell you exactly how the attacker got through in our real world attack, uh, you know, sort of protect the innocent as they say, um, but they did it, it happens all the time, and that really leads to the second step. Now here what happens is the backend spins up the container and prepares to execute the injected code, right? In the kinds of trends that we're seeing uh, here, you know, the, the um, security operations center analysts are typically seeing uh, these attackers pass the commands directly to the shell within a Docker container. And that was exactly what happened here. So now we've managed to have the container spin out, we've gotten access to a shell within that container, and the next Exam, uh, the next step in this is to start running the script that I'm going to use to carry out the rest of the attack. So the shell has been spawned, uh, for example, a Python shell, which will allow me to enter you know, Python code directly there and execute it, which really gives me a tremendous amount of power within the, the system there. And then by scripting all of it out uh, and executing a script, I can do everything in seconds, right? And that's exactly the way that this particular attack occurred. Uh, whoops, did I go too far? Oh, we got a little uh, out of order there. <laughs> Sorry about that. So uh, four, so the first thing uh, that I need to do is fetch the tools that I'm gonna use for the attack. Uh, so this means downloading a crypto mining executable to the local file system. Uh, in this particular case, the attacker ran a wget command to download the crypto mining, uh, crypto mining executable CNRIG and downloaded that to the local file system within the container. And now CNRIG is appealing to the attackers because it's able to auto-update. So once it's installed, you can kind of run it and forget it. So, so think about that. You know, I gain access to the system and I run this script that only takes seconds and then I basically never need to worry about it again. 
the executable will go on and on without me needing to risk uh, you know, sort of doing the, the break-in or the exploit again. So now I've got this executable downloaded and I need to do something to run it, so I need to give it permissions. Uh, so it, here, within the container again, I set permissions on CN rig with uh, chmod plus x. Uh, that command will let me run the executable basically as it is. And now if you remember, think about what containers, how they're supposed to work within a CD pipeline in a DevOps environment. It's supposed to be an immutable component, right? So changing uh, the permissions on a file within the file system should be a pretty strong signal that something's amiss, right? Uh, but remember, I'm doing this in a matter of seconds, and so the question becomes, you know, is anyone watching, and is anyone able to detect that? And uh, that's something that we're, we're going to circle around and, and come to a little bit later. So now, somehow, we got <laughs> slide six there, so we'll go back to step six here. Um, so I set the appropriate permissions, and now finally I just need to run the executable. Now in this case, um, I run it out of the temp directory, and so this is typical for malware, since it's common for all users to have permission to download and execute files out of temp. Um, so we'll come back to that yet again, too, because that's another one of these red flags. Think about uh, how you should be configuring and running processes out of containers. That's probably different than on a normal file system. So that takes us up to this final step. Uh, so CN rig comes to life and it starts to make the outbound network connection from the container through the house and out to the public internet. Now this is risky, but it's the only way to really benefit from the crypto mining, right? But remember, by now, as the attacker, I've moved on to my next target, right? I can do dozens or hundreds of these same uh, attacks. And at each of these steps, there's multiple different ways to, to get the job done, right? And that's what makes detection difficult. And, you know, the infrastructure and the applications keep changing. Um, so think about the, the pace of change in the last few years, right? We have containers and container orchestration and managed containers as a service. Uh, and even with serverless coming into view, uh, more and more these days. And even the pace of change up at the application layer above the container uh, is incredible too, right? So with DevOps and continuous delivery, you know, we might be releasing dozens of times per day compared to what something like quarterly in the past, right? So that's a lot more opportunity for flaws to be introduced uh, that can lead to things like uh, command injection, right? So as you've seen here, we've got this sort of stack of things uh, that are happening from the moment the exploit is started in the application tier down through the, the host and in the container. And the, the two steps that are really important here are detection and, and response, which is going to take us through the rest of the conversation this morning. So detection uh, is what needs to start this whole process, right? If this goes undetected, no matter how well we've planned and practiced, uh, we're not able to take the steps required to respond to this incident. So having a really great process in place to, um, you know, a system in place to be able to look for these types of um, ongoing events that are then going to trigger the processes that we have uh, set into place becomes critical. So in this case, you know, think about the, the attack that we just walked through, right? There's a lot of these red flags here that are, are, are pretty obvious, right? So why would you be running a shell in a container, right? You know, unless somebody is actually sitting uh, at a terminal uh, logged in there, you're, you shouldn't be running a shell. So things like that are, are good to watch for. Um, downloading an executable uh, in a containerized environment, again, with immutable infrastructure, we want to have everything that we need to uh, run the application built into that container when we deploy it so that there's not going to be real-time changes to it. And, uh, you know, since containers aren't meant to be interactive, again, this file permission change was a, was a big red flag. Um, the process activity out of temp directory, you know, would you, would you build your application to do that? These outbound network connections, uh, the ports that they're coming from, right? These are all red flags. Now, the challenge here is how do you have all of those types of things? Uh, and even at the application tier, we didn't even talk about analyzing the payloads that are coming in that are looking for potential command injection or uh, the improper use of the, you know, the uh, exec functionality or eval or something that allows the command to translate from the payload into the application tier, right? So coming up with this sort of unified view of all of those things to be able to detect it becomes a big challenge. So that's this notion of full stack observability that we talk about a lot here at uh, ThreatStack. Uh, our systems are designed to take bunch of these signals uh, together 
to help with this detection, right? So we're able to look at what's happening at the application tier, at the host. Uh, we see a lot that's happening down at the infrastructure uh, control plane, right? You know, uh, permissions on containers or um, uh, abilities for containers to start other containers and uh, spawn workloads, right? So this full stack observability is able to combine all of those signals and apply uh, rules to it uh, that are based on these types of typical red flags, right? Uh, once you've been able to do that detection too, by having this full stack observability approach, where you're combining all of those signals, it gives you the second point here under this uh, needs list, which is the ability to trace the full life cycle of the attack back to where it started, right? If I just see one thing and I'm viewing maybe a log file that gave me an indication of something like a file permission change, it doesn't string that in context to the other things that led to the attack. But by pulling all of those signals together and analyzing them in a reasonable way, uh, we can go back and trace the life cycle of it. So the, the post-mortem that we're going to talk about as part of the response process uh, basically becomes a lot simpler. Um, you know, a uh, quick, quick example here of how we were able to do that um, in, the part, in the particular case of this attack. Uh, so two particular alerts, you know, or the, the specific alert here, uh, we mentioned uh, running that process out of the temp directory. If we just knew that, yeah, that would be helpful and we'd know something's wrong, but it'd be difficult to trace it back and detect it. But by also having all of the other context from the Docker container, you know, what was happening, uh, what was the executable, where did it come from, what IP address was it running on, what port was it trying to communicate outside of the container through the, through the network, all of that helps us stitch together the, these missing pieces into a cohesive story uh, that we can use to really understand what's happening. Now, once we have that, it means we have to respond. So, so Dave, uh, I've been yapping a lot here about the, you know, the actual attack and the detection. Uh, why don't I let you chat a little bit about uh, some of the, the response steps, and then we'll talk about uh, how you can put that into practice in your own org. Sounds great. Thanks, Tim. Man, and I, I'm always blown away by the just the number of steps involved, and just the in you know the the uh, the amount of kind of hoops that an attacker is willing to jump through, and that that becomes really relevant when you know when it comes to these tabletop exercises and and you know being able to get into the mind of an attacker. So uh, really appreciate you taking us through there through that in detail. Um, when it comes to response, really the 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 one of the areas to focus on really is this this concept of active response because um, you know what we talk about a lot at PageDuty is is kind of active versus passive um, active being you know really what what is that, that kind of real-time work um, that requires immediate engagement because Tim what you what you went through um, very much you know it, it did dictated that an active response was necessary you needed a bunch of kind of real-time action to to shut that down, to contain, um, to eradicate that the the attack, and then and then basically once you once you got uh, you know once you did that, then more of the kind of recovery actions, um, forensic analysis, the kind of post incident steps, that kind of passive part of the response can kind of take take hold. Um, but these steps are really really part of what we see as kind of real time security operations. Um, so engaging the the right person um, or the right set of set of people from different teams especially um, collecting those those relevant signals together so being able to have you know a number of signals coming from uh, from threat stack maybe there's other signals that um, that have popped up from your sim that you can start to kind of correlate together and and start to give you kind of that broader picture that you know that observable uh, picture of exactly what's going on and the the what we see is that the the value of really engaging on those signals right away is so that you can determine tr determine uh, the severity and kind of understand triage. And honestly, that that piece, I mean, so so many of our customers, um, they really want to get to automated triage and you know, hey, as soon as I see this, this is automatically a P1 incident or this is a you know a severity two incident or however whatever your priority scheme looks like. Um, but fundamentally, a lot of uh, the customers that we work with, um, a lot of issues that you that you have to deal with, they require human triage. Um, there's there's only so much um, that you can kind of programmatically put out there in terms of rules 
um, even with machine learning um, and the ability to, to kind of learn over time and look for the right signals, you can start to automate a little bit more of that triage. Um, but a, such a, a large amount of, of triage still is, is determinant on uh, the on-call engaging on exactly what's going on. Um, and so, you know, in cases like this, we, that's definitely what we encourage is kind of get that signal to the right person right away, um, get them engaged. If they determine that, hey, it's something that they can, you know, push off to tomorrow, then great, um, snooze that or, you know, come back and, and take care of it in terms of more, more of a passive response. Um, escalating to the appropriate response level involves, you know, do I need to involve different teams? Do I need to notify uh, stakeholders within the, the rest of the organization? And then, and then basically kind of starting to catalog exactly the, the different activities that you're doing. And um, another piece that we see a lot of our customers use are, you know, security orchestration, automation response tools, um, SOAR, and being able to actually kind of sync that activity back in um, to those source systems is a, a, another kind of great value. But, it, but again, you want to take that, that kind of critical signal, start that active response um, in cases that it's necessary and really kind of engage quickly and then, and then basically kind of determine, hey, do we need to queue up a bunch of work for later? Um, and, or you know, can we close down a response bridge right now and, and kind of take care of this tomorrow? Or um, you know, in, the, in this particular case, obviously not. I mean, there's a much more of an active response that your team went through. Um, and again, that's why having an integrated tool chain, um, being able to take signals from threat stack, feed them directly into PagerDuty, get the right people engaged right away um, is huge. And uh, just that really, really piggybacks right into um, this idea of lived experience. You've got to be able to practice it. Um, you've got to be able to prepare for this and actually start to get ahead of it. And this is uh, this is my attempt to uh, you know to uh, channel my uh, Broadway roots here. Um, you know, singing the Lion King, be prepared. Um, but honestly, a lot of the research that we've done with um, with incident management, uh, fire battalion chiefs, um, really understanding what is state of art with respect to incident response and how that can be applied to IT operations, to security operations, um, has been understanding how these organizations can be prepared, how they can communicate um, in these situations where, um, you know, where most people will just panic. Right, and and you're trying to trying to get a, a better handle on this. You're trying to very calmly go through, you know, the your tr your training effectively, and that's where this um, this kind of preparedness comes really only through practice. Um, you know, you've got you definitely want to leverage the, the the tools that are available to you. Um, you know, you you building checklists is not definitely not a, a terrible thing by any means, but um, but you, the 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 ultimate preparation is really going to come through practice. And one of the anecdotes that really stands out um, to me in, in some of the research that I got to do as part of um, you know understanding the National Incident Management System NIMS um, is really talking to uh, you know a battalion chief who said you know they were coming up on um, on a house that was on fire and you know a little old lady had had just basically run out and was was basically just, you know, she was was uh, completely uh, overwhelmed with what was going on and hysterical. Um, and he said to her calmly, you know, ma'am, this, this may be your first fire, but it's not ours. Um, and that's really what it comes down to in terms of preparedness is you want people who are experts in the process, who have really practiced that process. Um, and so many of the customers that we talk to um, just have, they, they, they haven't done that. They haven't um, kind of exercise that on a regular basis. Um, you know, you look at things like business continuity plans that um, that organizations come up with, and you, you're lucky if you do if you practice them once a, once a year um, in many cases because hey, they they are expensive. We get it, um, but un unfortunately, when that business continuity plan is you know something that sits in a um, in a book on a shelf that nobody uses, um, you know, on a regular on a semi regular basis. Um, then it's just not going to be something that you can really rely on in a, in a crisis situation. So being prepared, um, you know, I, I, I threw up the, you know, EPA checklist there for, for, uh, for security or for, for emergency preparedness. I don't really have anything against checklists. Um, honestly, checklists are a wonderful thing. Um, there's a great 
great resource that we have, um, our open source incident response documentation at response.pagerduty.com. Um, and it, we have a section that is our, you know, our kind of internal security incident checklist. What are some of the key things that we look for in the case of a security incident, whether that's reported um, through great tools like ThreatStack or whether that's um, reported directly to us um, via one of our employees um, or, or via the community as well. Um, and this, these are the types of things that we're looking at. So really nothing against checklists. They are absolutely a valuable, um, a valuable resource, but you know, ultimately I, I don't want you to stop at just building a checklist and saying, Hey, we're, we're ready because that's, that's not what the point is here. The point is that you want to be able to run these things called tabletop exercises. Um, and you know, if you're not familiar with tabletop exercises, um, there's the NIST, NIST definition up there on the um, on the slide, and you can kind of see that you know it talks about about being a discussion-based exercise. So you're kind of you know mocking out some scenario and basically walking through it. Um, now, what what we've seen is you know even more practical than kind of your traditional tabletop exercises when you can start to um, kind of meld that with um, with this uh, this concept of kind of chaos engineering that is kind of taking hold within um, within the industry, and so you've got um, you know variations of uh, of tabletops where you've got you know blue and red teams um, in more of kind of a capture the flag type um, type setup. Uh, you've got this concept of game days, which was coined by uh, Jesse Robbins. Um, back at back when he was um, at Amazon, he was the master of disaster, and he, um, you know, was looking to inject failure effectively into their into their production systems. Um, and we we kind of coined that, um, you know, we basically took that concept at PagerDuty and we turned that into our our own kind of game days or chaos days. Um, chaos days comes from uh, actually from our friends at Gremlin, um, who you know have built kind of a chaos engineering service. And uh, you know this idea of failure Fridays is something that we actually started. You can see, um, you know, over over five years ago, um, and, and have been running basically every Friday, every other Friday. Um, and it's where we take and inject failure into our production systems. But more than that, more than just the chaos engineering part of it, of you know, hey, can I, you know, can I uh, affect the reliability of this system, or can I, you know, potentially exploit, um, you know, some vulnerability in in our production system. Um, the the va the real value that we've seen um, beyond just the you know the technical parts of are we monitoring the right things um, is really around our process and how we're able to effectively kind of exercise our um, you know incident response best practices on a regular basis. Um, and now I, I will say that there's a bit of a delineation between um, tabletops. And uh, you know, and and chaos engineering in that just the the goal is obviously different. Um, and so we wanted to give you some you know some uh, some uh, ideas as to how you could prepare for um, you know a tabletop exercise yourself. And really, where it starts is looking at the scenario specifically. Um, and there's this great Twitter handle, um, Bad Things Daily, tweeting out um, some really great kind of uh, scenarios on a regular basis. Um, that give you some good ideas as to how to start to build great scenarios um, for this. And really, there's a, a couple of key points to, to kind of building scenarios that we wanted to instill in, um, you know, in you in, in this to get you, you know, interested in this, but also, um, you know, thinking in kind of the right direction. So the first I've already mentioned, thinking like an attacker. Um, and, and honestly, this idea of, um, of empathy, it goes beyond just, um, you know, running tabletops and um, in this particular case, you know, building kind of a, you know, red blue team type um, type setup because uh, empathy is, uh, you know, is just understanding where somebody else within your organization even um, is coming from. So whether that's, you know, getting, um, you know, your development teams who, you know, who own their services in production, you build it, you own it, um, you know, you build it, you run it, um, you know, code it, ship it, own it, which is kind of uh, the mantra that we, that we live by at PagerDuty. Really uh, understanding somebody else's world, getting in their shoes, um, and being able to to kind of channel that is just such a valuable um, valuable thing, a valuable part of running um, really any any digital business, any kind of technical business, especially. Um, so think like an attacker. Um, the next is you want to identify a scenario that's going to stretch your current process. 
So you, you don't want to just, you know, kind of, um, you know, for the things that you're already looking at, maybe, um, you know, oh, well, we're just kind of testing the, you know, the same old, same old stuff here. No, you want to be able to stretch, um, stretch, stretch your current process and really start to understand, um, understand that a little bit better. Um, the next is don't limit yourself to, to your team. So, you know, most, mostly what we see in organizations is the tabletops are run by the security team, um, kind of in their own, um, you know, in their own space. And those can be absolutely valuable. We've run tabletops within our security team internally at PageDuty um, on a number of occasions. But where we're really starting to see the value is, is branching out beyond just the security team. So again, in a DevOps mindset, being able to actually pull in other teams, um, you know, other technical teams, certainly, who are, you know, building services that could potentially be attacked. Um, or even build, bring in kind of other people from the rest of uh, of kind of your corporate organization. So maybe maybe it's that you actually run a scenario more more in line with um, you know your corporate Twitter account being hacked, as an example. What what would you go? What what steps would you take? What what would your process look like? What would communication look like in order to actually start to get um, get people different people from your organization who you know maybe they're a part of your marketing organization organization maybe they're part of you know uh, public relations and and understanding you know how how you kind of get in and build a response around that um, is a really good exercise for you for you um, you know something to, for you to flex on a regular basis um, the next is throw the curveball honestly um, I think one of the one of the most fun uh, tabletops that we've run is is actually where you know we kind of had a blue blue red team set up um, and uh, what what the the blue team didn't didn't understand or didn't know until kind of partway through the exercise was there was actually a second red team um, with a separate separate target kind of um, going at them at the same time and that you know that was a, a really fun kind of curveball to throw just uh, to really shake things up um, you know to uh, to really keep you on your toe on your toes but also you know to again stretch your process and understand how you would handle a, a situation like that because that that certainly may happen in in you know in in real real situations and then finally um, you know you're not building uh, you don't want to go off and build a bunch of custom tools for this um, you know we do this for failure Friday certainly in the case of injecting failure into our systems we've um, open source something called chaos cat that is kind of our um, you know, chaos monkey equivalent um, that injects failure into, into our systems. But you, you really don't need to do that for a number of these, these tabletops. You get to leverage your current tool set. Um, you want to make take advantage of all the things that you already have a access to, um, because that's that's kind of uh, it's what you what you're going to have to work with um, if you're going to defend against one of these attacks anyway. And hey, Dave, just uh, quickly yeah. on that that last point. Um, you know, I think in this case, you know, we were talking about uh, Docker earlier. Uh, tools like that can make this even uh, easier, right? Because we can create these environments that already reflect uh, a, a situation that we want to test. It's easy to spin those up and tear them down and have them run alongside our normal production infrastructure and do some traffic shaping to direct, uh, you know, traffic where it should be instead of there. So uh, definitely uh, the, the way that we build and deploy systems today I think makes this uh, ability to kind of create these scenarios uh, even stronger. So that's a great point. And and honestly, uh, like you're saying, Tim, to to actually do it in in production, right? I mean, you're not in some you know kind of uh, you know pseudo environment. Like you're actually testing in production, which is a, a really big big part of you know good chaos engineering practices um, because that's that's what that's what you're gonna that's really how you're gonna get better. Um, and you know to be able to do it in a in in some somewhat of a controlled environment is going to benefit you so much more than, you know, when, when and if that attack comes, um, you know, and you see something like that in, in, in production later from a, a somebody malicious. So uh, in, when it comes time to actually run, running it, um, again, be, be mindful of a couple of things. So, you know, location, um, you know, this is, this is one thing where you may want to start with everybody in the same room. Um, so, you know, if you're doing running kind of red blue team, um, you know, having having everybody in the same room um, may be fine. You, you may be running on a, uh, you know, with a small team where that actually makes the most sense. Um, you know, in uh, for our organization, we've actually run it um, in cases where we've got the, you know, the red team in one one office location and then the blue team in, 
in a different office location um, and starting to extend out that way. Um, you can obviously do it with uh, different conference rooms or you can do it purely purely remote, which we've done actually even with um, you know some of our quote unquote offsites, team offsites, we've actually kind of dabbled with this idea of um, of doing it purely remote where everybody's kind of connected in um, to the same call, same call at the same time. Um, and so there's a number of different ways to do it, but just be mindful of it because it does affect um, you know, the, the reality of the situation and how you would respond um, in, in kind of a, a real life situation. And again, this is where having something like PageDuty where you know, you've got people on call, people who are on the go on a regular basis, um, where it's, it's uh, you know, much more natural um, to be able to actually kind of distribute your workforce that way. Um, be mindful of verbiage. Uh, so this is one thing that um, we see regularly talking to uh, all this, the security teams that uh, that we have using PagerDuty um, is that oftentimes, uh, you know, security folks, you you have your own, um, you know, your own definition of uh, what priority means. You got your own uh, own scheme for that, um, own you know, kind of set of severities and. Uh, and that becomes really difficult when it comes to broaching uh, kind of conversation and communication with the rest of the organization. So just be mindful of that. You want to, you know, we we uh, we talk a lot about um, about clear communication. That clear communication is much more important than concise communication. So you know, get rid of things like um, you know TLAs, uh, three-letter acronyms. Um, you know that that those those sorts of things are really um, how you start to um, make sure that that communication is clear um, throughout the organization. You kind of create that common ground. Um, the roles involved. So you you may in the in the first couple of tabletops that you run, you may not need kind of formal role definition. Um, you know, we've got uh, in our response uh, response trainings um, that again are open source. There, um, we've we've got definitions for incident commander, uh, deputy scribe, uh, kind of communications liaisons. Um, and then kind of the subject matter expert team. You may not need that full structure um, to begin with, but it's definitely something to kind of build towards because you know having a good incident command rotation and really having a, a clear definition of what the incident commander is doing, how they're driving uh, the process forward. And again, being a master of the process, not necessarily the technical details. Um, oftentimes I think we as engineers get, uh, you know, just we wear too many hats at the same time, and so that can that can be kind of uh, you know something that especially in a in in a tabletop exercise like this, you want to have you know clear a, a clear kind of incident command leader um, who's not responsible for you know the technical aspects, the forensics, etc., um, but who is really driving the process forward and keeping everybody on track. And then finally, communications process. How do you you know branch out? Um, you know what. At what point in you know in this attack would you actually reach out and you know engage your CEO or you know your PR team or um, you know your uh, you know marketing group or whoever ha whoever else happens to be um, need to be involved? So be aware of those things. So a lot of great kind of uh, again, this is a great example scenario. Um, Tim, anything else you want to add on the on the scenario here? Yeah. So you know, I think uh, all of these uh, points while you're executing the, the exercise are important, you know, with things like uh, with Docker and with Kubernetes and with serverless and, you know, the changing landscape of how we build and deploy, you know, value to customers through software, it's important for us to continually evaluate our ability to have the visibility that we need to respond to these sorts of things. So, you know, in the Docker case, you know, can you can you see what's happening in your container environments and uh, you know what would you trigger and you know what are those red flags? Um, one thing that I think is is great when we're talking about these as exercises is it gives us a great opportunity to apply analysis of metrics, right? So we only know if we're getting better if we're able to measure things. And yeah. in the case of of these exercises, uh, the one that I think is is most important from my perspective is this mean time to know, right? That uh, the, the duration from when the event is happening until you can activate all of the things that, that you've just laid out as part of the plan. How, you know, what's the duration there and how can we shrink it and are we getting better? Uh, and reducing that uh, is, is going to be a good indicator of the, uh, the ability of the team to respond. Doing these exercises on a regular basis gives us an opportunity to measure those things and apply some good, uh, good science-based metrics to, to the process. Great. Yeah, great point. And, and actually what that sparked one of the, one of the scenarios that we've run ourselves is, you know, 
um, given the, the the proliferation of of you know chat bots and the ability to again do do so much via chat now um, in a visible environment, you know what would happen? Uh, you know we've run a scenario where um, you know an employee was offboarded, but we've you know forgot to take away their access to Slack, so they've got you know lost access to everything but Slack. What could how much damage could they do? And you know, you'd be surprised. Um, certainly, in the case of you know these organizations with you know uh, chatbots that are really really quite powerful. Um, you know, the the amount of damage that you could potentially cause. And so, um, you know, the, these are the types of things that are really great great things to exercise and kind of, you know, understand. Um, you know, what the what that kind of uh, impact would look would look like. All right. So I don't want to. Uh, I. I think one of the things that we definitely see on a regular basis too, and and Tim, you you emphasize this very much, is, is that you know closing that feedback loop of you know hey you've gone through this exercise, um, or you know maybe it is an actual kind of uh, real life security incident. Have you actually gone through and and learned from it? Um, because I you know this is definitely the the area that most of our you know. Uh, you know, speaking self-critically as well, um, most most people in the industry, including ourselves, we you know we tend to skimp on in a lot of cases. Um, John Alspa, who is definitely you know one of the leaders here around uh, kind of human factors and in, in IT operations and and really understanding kind of this idea of uh, blameless culture and really un, you know asking asking the right questions as part of this learning process is really a huge part of it. Um, so. You know, be be certainly mindful of um, your assumptions, the biases that you have as you kind of unpack. You know, what what, what actually did happen um, in this exercise? You know, what was the timeline? What did it look like? Um, and and just uh, you know, be aware of those those kind of edges of your process. Um, you know, if you had moments in the in you know in this running the exercise where it's like, hey, you know, how how we would respond, like how what our process says to do is this. Um, but you know, I really want to do that. Um, you know, you, you know, be those are great things to kind of point out and and call out and come back and revisit as part of more of a process conversation of like, hey, you know, maybe we need to actually rethink this or add some more flexibility to this. And then finally, around kind of organizational edges, I, I mean, fundamentally, attackers are not going to care. They don't they don't care. Give a damn about your org structure um, whatsoever. Ever. And so, you know, be aware of, you know, this is where, again, like a security team running um, tabletops in isolation with no kind of communication with the, the rest of the organization, you know, you may not understand kind of the breadth of the applications that your, you know, uh, development operations teams um, are putting out there. And, and so you, that's where, again, you want to, you want to involve them. You got to, got to open those lines of communication. Um, we open source just recently, um, you know, in addition to that response.pagerduty.com that I've mentioned earlier, um, postmortems.pagerduty.com, um, you know, open source that, uh, I think, uh, maybe a week or two ago. And, um, you know, really great response from the community. Again, this is, um, you know, open source. So please, uh, you know, sub submit pull requests or use it as a resource, a template to, to really kind of unpack and really build kind of better learning. Um, out of some of these, you know, high value, high, you know, high impact events. Um, and one of the questions that really, you know, John Alspa, uh, you know, stated in, in one of his recent talks that really stood out to me is this one, what made this incident not nearly as bad as it could have been? Because we, we focus so much on, okay, we got to get better here. We got to, you know, we got to do more here. We need better tooling here, better monitoring, et cetera. Um, you know, take a moment to appreciate the, the things that you've put in place, and it's not just appreciation, but really understand what you're reliant on, what your dependencies are, um, you know, what made this incident not nearly as bad as it could have been. So there we go. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's great. It's such a great, uh, a great question to, to ask for yourself. So um, thanks, Dave. You know, I'm obviously, uh, my, my bias is prevention, <laughs> right? Towards prevention yeah. rather than uh, reaction. And, you know, that's a whole other topic of, uh, you know, sort of how do we prevent these things in the first place. But uh, I realize, um, you know, as a person who's been seeing software built and delivered for a long time, that it's unavoidable. These things will happen. Uh, and uh, ultimately, you know, as, we, as we've discussed today, 
the ability of attackers to find new ways to exploit whatever you do will, will continue. So the best thing that we can do is learn from uh, these types of things to be able to come up with a plan. And that lived experience, uh, I think we can all speak to uh, as being critical to it. So if we can hopefully not have to live the experience through real world uh, incidents, but if we can live that experience through a simulation, uh, all the better. Definitely. No doubt. Yeah. So we'll, we uh, we will be at RSA. Um, you know, DevSecOps Day. Um, we're very uh, PagerDuty. We're we're very excited to uh, to be there, engage with um, you know the community at large, talk about um, you know containers, tabletops. You can see my my kitchen renovations joke there since we were talking about containers and tabletops. Um, in case anybody didn't get it, but you know we'd love to <laughs> continue to talk about DevSecOps and really how um, you know empowering teams to. Uh, understand security, engage in that security conversation can um, can just really transform. Um, yeah, excited to be there with ThreatStack as well. Yeah, and you know uh, we've we've tried to keep the conversation today, uh, you know, not a product pitch, uh, not a product demo, uh, and we hope uh, you found the information helpful. Uh, but obviously, you know, uh, ThreatStack and PagerDuty work really well together. There's great inter integration between the two products, and uh, and among other products that you'll have uh, as part of your you know, security world and your software development world and your operations world. So uh, events like this are a great opportunity to connect with uh, with both of us. We'd be happy to, to show you how these pieces fit together and, and give you a deeper look at uh, both of our solutions and, and how they uh, how they work there. Uh, but I think that leaves us a, a few minutes for a couple of questions. It looks like uh, there have been some uh, questions pouring in. So uh, how are we looking, Charlene? Do you have some? Yeah, uh, yeah. we've got some really great questions that have come in. Um, but just a quick reminder to the audience, if you do have a question, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. We'll get to as many as we can, but judging by the number of questions that we've gotten in so far, we're probably not going to get to all of them, so I'm going to apologize in advance if we don't get to your question. Um, but uh, the folks at ThreatStack and PagerDuty will be getting a copy of the questions that come in, uh, so I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline. Okay, let's go ahead and start out with the first question. Um, Tim, I think this one is for you. How do you monitor for code for code injection in the first place? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. And you know, we kind of danced around that, of course, in the in the the incident here. You know, how exactly did they get in? Um, so for me, it's it's kind of two parts, right? So the first part is to practice good, secure software development to reduce the likelihood of uh, code injection being possible in the first place, right? So this involves uh, everything from uh, having your developers well trained on how to avoid, uh, you know, the software flaws in the first place. Uh, having a good testing process, you know, we provide uh, a solution here that allows you to get proactive feedback on your code as you're developing it early to look for potential flaws that, that would be uh, open for code injections. And then uh, our solution as well can actually monitor uh, payloads as they're coming in and the, the execution of the software as it's running. Um, there's a number of ways to do that, you know, um, ours is one of them, but, uh, you know, other, other solutions as well that are in this kind of runtime security space. Um, so I think that's really the, the solution is it's a combination of being proactive in the first place to avoid these common pitfalls, you know, unsanitized user input, um, and then also have a good solution in place that can, can monitor for, uh, you know, looking at the traffic as it comes into your application. Awesome. All right. Great. Next question. Uh, how do you get executive buy-in for running tabletops? I, I can take a stab at this one, Tim. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I mean, a couple of things. I, one is definitely we talk about the cost, um, you know, the cost of a major incident to, you know, to your business and, you know, really being able to understand, hey, what is what does downtime cost us? Um, you know, uh, certainly in the case of a security incident, it's, it's going to be, you know, even more extreme with respect to, you know, the the value or the targets that um, an attacker may be, may be after. Um, but if even if you look at operational incidents, you know, you can look at cost of downtime. Um, you know, you can, that that's one that our, our, a lot of our customers, you know, commonly start to think about. And the one that we really try to encourage them to think, um, to add into the equation as well is actually what is your cost of response? Um, so if you're, you know, waking up 30 people in your organization at, you know, 3 a.m. and, you know, they're on a call for, you know, say two hours, um, kind of, 
trying to sort through an incident, you know, what what is the cost of that to your organization um, in terms of just the, you know, the people hours um, that are spent there, and uh, it it can really get astronomical, honestly. And so that's one thing that one one measure that certainly um, you know t- the PagerDuty product certainly can you know put right in front of you with with some of our analytics. Um, we also have a, a a product called PagerDuty Visibility that um, starts to surface some of those impact metrics that can give you a better idea of what those costs are. But um, honestly, the one that I still attached to I mean you know uh, certainly those ones are important um, and can get that executive buy-in but you know this is training like this is this is employee training this is team building um, these are the types of exercises that are great for things like offsites that you know your teams may be doing already spend a half day run a you know run a great tabletop like you know make sure you, you do some prep for it and um, you know it can be a really great exercise of just uh, of, of getting a team to bond and and also kind of upping their skill set across the board Okay. And we awesome. see executives are are pretty uh, are responding well to this type of thing uh, in many cases due to compliance and regulatory uh, issues as well, right? So yeah. um, having the plan in place as part of a you know SOC two type two um, plan uh, process uh, or other regulatory uh, and compliance issues that say not only do you have to have this plan but you have to be able to demonstrate that you've uh, you've carried it out is is a great one too. Executives really get that. <laughs> so you can leverage that in making the argument as well. Okay. Good point. Uh, all right. Great. Uh, another question related to the tabletops. How big an organization do you have to be to start running tabletops? Ooh, um, well, honestly, we see uh, PagerDuty started our failure Fridays, honestly, when we were like 35 to 40 employees total. Um, you know, and that was probably, you know, 25 uh, engineers at the time. So really the organization does not need to be um, humongous to start this idea of, you know, practicing process, starting to, um, you know, understand uh, understand what, you know, what that looks like uh, for your organization at your size. Um, but definitely as you grow, as you scale, um, you know, you want to want to do, um, you know, I think you can really introduce it um, around that size and, uh, you know, and be in kind of a, a good place and be be more feel really feel more prepared more than anything. OK, all right. Uh, next question. Uh, I think this uh, has to do again with code injections. Um, so maybe for you, Tim, are there security features in Docker or, or Kubernetes? I think it is to protect against this type of attack. This type, I believe, is code injection. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, you know, as we saw in the beginning, um, in that scenario, there are lots of different, uh, you know, parts of the container application ecosystem that were that were uh, that played a role in the attack. Uh, I mean, remember that the container itself is is kind of a dumb thing, right? It just it, it holds. Uh, everything that's required to run the application. So the container itself isn't going to give you protection. You need to protect the container. So things like using, um, you know, a secure uh, hardened container image, uh, making sure that the control plane for your container orchestrator, Kubernetes, uh, you know, there's there's been some high profile attacks uh, that have leveraged uh, weakness in the control plane to get access and then to be able to spawn containers and, and destroy containers. Um, so, you know, around that, that ecosystem of containers as an application, uh, you know, kind of runtime approach, uh, there are things that you have to think about for security, but the container itself, you know, simply putting an application in a container, uh, doesn't give you protection, you know, uh, the same, uh, web application vulnerabilities that can be exploited for command injection or SQL injection or cross-site scripting, um, those exist whether you're running on-prem in, you know, traditional infrastructure, whether you're running in the cloud, whether you're running in containers or, or even serverless, right? Uh, the, the application tier is always there. So yeah, you have to think about how the containerized environment uh, changes things. Uh, and in some regards, it's a little better because you get some isolation uh, from other processes that might uh, make up your the rest of your application landscape. But, you know, simply popping things in a container uh, doesn't make it inherently secure. All right, great. Well, as expected, uh, we didn't get to all of the questions, but I do have to close out the Q&A period of today's webinar. Uh, again, if we didn't get to your questions, I apologize, but uh, the folks at ThreatStack and PagerDuty will be getting a copy of all the questions, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline. 
Um, also want to remind the audience that today's event has been uh, recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, or if you just want to listen to it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. We are going to be sending out an email after today's broadcast that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always find it there. Just go to the webinar section, click on on demand, and it should be right there. And while you're there, please take a look at all the other webinars that we have both upcoming and on demand. They Hopefully there'll be one or two or three or four that pique your interest. Tim and Dave, thank you so much for giving such a great presentation today. I know I got a lot out of it and I, judging from the number of questions we got, I know the audience did as well. So thanks very much. Thank you, Charlene. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Thank All right. Well, I'd like day. to thank the audience also for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day.